I've been doing a lot of thinking about the alt-right. What did they stand for before the whole SJW thing became such a popular topic? Besides being popular, it's a hot button. What was the alt-right like before then? Well, there certainly wasn't much support for gay men. And people like Steven Crowder still don't support gay men. Steven Crowder is more of the embodiment of the alt-right than Milo is. And I think Milo was doing a lot of this to try to make it look like, look, the alt-right is being picked on. Look, we're being bullied. Feel sorry for us because we're being bullied. It's, it, it's, it's funny to watch. Pathetic, but funny. Sad thing is, gay men are being thrown under the bus by feminists. And if the alt-right gets their way, which don't even seem disappointed if, you know, it's Republicans, and not just those that are, you know, would cons be considered alt-right. Most of the people on the alt-right would prefer Republicans over Democrats, no matter how much religion they try to cram into things. And, you know, once the right wing seems to have more power, they will dump their gay, their support of gay men like that. Milo will no longer be considered a celebrity, not nearly like he is now. You know, it's like, oh, look! Look, we've, we've got someone gay that's on our side, that's actually on our side. Wow, we're gonna celebrate this all we can. Look, look, left-wingers, look, look, we have someone gay on our side. Look, look at this. Which kind of seems to be uh, what most of this is really about. But the alt-right propping up Milo would be the same as some uh, black guy uh, propping up the BNP. And they'll go, oh, this is a great opportunity. And they'll, they'll let him speak a lot, so it looks like they don't believe what they believe. If the right wing gets their way, gay men are going to get the shit end of both sides of the stick. I'm gonna go back to Steven Crowder for a moment, though. Why would they even let someone like him represent them? Well, probably because he's more along the lines of what they believe anyway, and they don't really see that much wrong with it. And there's a difference between the way that comedians who are well-respected, go about bringing up things that are politically incorrect. And most of the time when someone is very politically incorrect in their humor, and they are well-respected, they don't bring up the politically incorrect things to push forth an ideology. They're not trying to get you to believe anything specific, they're just trying to get you to question things. That's how that usually works. Once it becomes a big political message at the same time, yeah, that's looked at as, well, it's propaganda. It's almost a form of brainwashing. And we certainly don't appreciate it when we see the radical feminists going up on stage and doing radical feminist humor. We look at that and go, wow, that's, that's, that's awful. Well, it's just as awful when the alt-right does this same thing. It's why, I mean, people who are just generally on the right doing this same thing. Not necessarily the alt-right, you know, Rush Limbaugh. He's got an audience. It's kind of a niche audience, but he has an audience enough to, to, to pay his bills. But when there's a very particular political message that messes with, with people, they don't really want to listen. And, I, and who could blame them? That's one of the good things about South Park. Okay, South Park isn't trying to shove forth a specific message. And when you try to get some sort of moral out of it, you go, no, that's just so wrong, because it is. And they do that on purpose. Okay, that's part of, you know, what will make something actually funny? Ha ha, funny, you know? But when it becomes just some giant political message, I mean, you might as well be watching uh, The 700 Club. Let's watch CBN. Hi, Pat Robertson. I've seen a number of people who are very, uh, very anti-Islam. I mean, to just extremes. And some of the people that have the disdain for it end up posting stuff from the 700 Club. And it's like they don't even realize that that's what it's from. And it's the ones trying to shove forth that, oh, we're going to have Sharia law here in the United States. Let's, let's put video clips from the 700 Club. Yay! Most people who are bullied can't wait to get out of having to be in school. And guess what? You, you don't, generally, until the internet came up, you never had to deal with that shit after you were done with high school. 
when you got into college. I mean, there's a different kind of thing going on. Sometimes there's the frat boy shit going on. But you don't deal with the kind of bullying you did in high school or, or middle school or elementary school. But on the internet, oh, we're supposed to look up to this somehow. Like, like being an adult is all about knowing how to deal with bullying, as if bullying is some, something that should be a part of our lives throughout our whole lives. Does anyone remember the It Gets Better project? It's the one that tells gay people, hey, you know, it gets better after high school. Are you just basically declaring that that's a crock of shit and uh, maybe people should just kill themselves if they don't want to deal with that sort of thing the rest of their life because you're going out of your way to make sure that they have to deal with that shit the rest of their lives? Hmm? Life is hard. So we're going to just, we're going to make it even harder for people? That's, that, that makes no sense. That, that argument makes no sense. And as I talked about in the past, I, I think that there are a number of causes for why someone with a genetic predisposition for, to be able to be bi or to be able, I guess, to be gay, go with just gay on a subconscious level, not some conscious choice that's made. The brain just goes, dude, okay, we'll deal with that is because of either like you know a bad uh bad relationship with one's father or no relationship or didn't have a father it can come from a, a a number of other it could come from some traumatic situation but bullying is one of those things too i think that's a huge amount of it because someone will will drop their Id the idea in their head that masculinity is a good thing because they associate this idea of masculinity with the bullying. Just how anyone could somehow see this as a good thing is beyond me. Life is hard, so you're going to make it harder? I'm going to go out of my way to make it harder. I'm doing something good for the world. No, you're making it shit. But if you got a five-second uh, chuckle out of some people, it's I, I guess it's worth it. It's, it's just like a bunch of people saying, well, I learned to get past it. And since you can't or don't want to, well, that just makes me that much more powerful. Why would I want to give that up? I mean, why would why would someone who is a bully to people want to give up that power? They're going to defend it left and right. No, it's cool, man. It's cool. It's it's cool, man. It, no, no, it's cool, man. So if people who do this even admit that what they're doing is harmful, if they admit it, just saying that takes away that power because they can no longer in their mind pass it off as something that's just great. It sheds doubt on the idea that it's great. Kind of pops that bubble, doesn't it? Being good at dealing with bullying only helps you in the area of being good at dealing with those who are bullying. And most of the time, in order to learn how to deal with it, you have to become one. Because if you bully a bully, they'll often stop. So you have to learn how to be a bully. Somehow, things have translated to that being a good thing. Someone could say, well, it's always a good skill to have. And I'm like, not really. Before the internet, we didn't have to deal with this shit as adults. It's something people were glad to finally be rid of. Because it's juvenile. It's pathetic. It's like people wanting any excuse they can to go through a second childhood, and yet they want to make it sound like someone who, for whatever reason, uh, believes that they are were born the wrong sex, that those people are, are crazy and they need to be chastised. But, you know, to go through a second childhood and look at the world in such juvenile eyes as if you were 12 or 10, that's somehow a good thing? It's almost like some people are trying to claim that it's a good thing, that they have a really twisted, messed up version of Peter Pan syndrome. Now sure, someone can put up on a pedestal how children often act. People can put that up on a pedestal. Whether it's good for society, well, you know. So, you know, if you want to use childish reasoning, and you want to make excuses for wanting to relive your childhood as an adult, 
Then you can kiss my ass. <laughs>